not true. He doesn't always give us only the good times. And a Christian long enough to know that, don't you? There's still hard times. As a believer in Jesus Christ, there's still hard times. That God is behind those hard times, and He ordains the hard times. Part of His purpose, no doubt, is to educate. Mom and Dad wants Junior, female or male, to learn to advance to grow. God wants to educate us. He's constantly educating us. He wants us to know. He wants us to see. He's trying to help us to see. What do we need to see? We need to see ourselves. He already knows. But we need to see ourselves, where we are, what we're about, where we stand. Worshippers, are we indeed? He knows. Do we recognize many by these few words so far this morning? We also have been, maybe currently are, worshippers of the good times. I can't make it. If I can make it here, said Frank. If I can make it here, I can make it anywhere. <laughs> Listen, in a world that is suffering, you and I have it easier, far easier than oh so many. Many of you come from countries, various countries and lands where loved ones are in the same world and yet they are going through things like ours, but more severely. Isn't it comforting to know that He is their God as well as He is our God? Amen. Mm -hmm. We can trust Him. He is in charge. But they also need to know that the answer is not in good circumstances. The answer is not in good times or a good, good environment. Good government is not the answer. We may have our suspicions about the quality of our government. That doesn't mean we cannot have joy. That does not mean we should be or could, can truly be fighting the pride of rich lives in Jesus Christ. No matter who these kings might be over us, worshippers of the good times, but let it happen. How do you fit in, frankly, with that standard? I've been shining up on the walls in the bulletin. Have you ever thought about it? Could it be true? Are you yourself a worshiper of good times? Is at the center of your being the good times, good times? Beware, O oh Christian, of what is your Lord? Think about this. June 29, 1929. I was 20 years still not in existence. 1929, June, the American economy ceased its expansion. It was hardly noticed. Same year, September 3, 1929, the bull market in stocks came to an end. A few of us in this room know about bull and bear markets. <coughs> On Monday, October 21, for the first time, using the antiquated ticker tape system, they didn't have any highly technical means they do right this minute. The ticker tape system couldn't keep up with the transactions, and so many businesses and dreams were failing that the ticker tape couldn't keep up with it, and they never did catch up with it. Frantic panic. Panic entered into the lives of so many, intensifying as savings, just like today, were being lost, and as homes were at stake. Soon, Thursday, October 24th, 1929, absolutely no buying happened on the stock exchange. Crowds gathered on Broad Street outside the New York Stock Exchange, and by the end of that day, Thursday, October 24th, 1929, 11 well-known men in Wall Street had committed suicide. Things were desperate. Many others committed suicide in the days and months and years following. The following week, Tuesday, called, and forgive us, but it was called Black Tuesday. It was bleak. Things were gone. Things were lost. Things were irretrievable. Security, what kind of security was it? There was 
financial atrocity, and there was suffering, and executives and men of vast fortunes ended up selling fruit on the corners and were thankful for sales to bring anything home. People suffered, many died of diseases, surgical things, Contributing was the fact there was not enough food. Many suffered. There was great pain. We today don't know what is going ahead even here. What were the lessons there? We're still learning them. In many ways, we don't know still what happened 50 years ago, 60 years ago, at that great depression. But I, I look at it, and I think again, the 20s had been to that point pretty prosperous, just like our 21st century to fairly recently have been too. Was God working then like he's working today? And is there something we should be learning ourselves? In the statement, God ordains the hard times to allow us to see whether we are worshippers of the good times. He knows. Do we know? Have we been failing? And we've been worshipping the good times and not worshipping him. And not putting him first in our lives. <coughs> Turn in your Bible to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And chapter 6 of Timothy we preached on many years ago here with great benefit, I believe, but benefit because of the power of these verses. And in 1 Timothy chapter 6, look at verse 17. For Paul's instruction to the young man Timothy, he says, Charge them, charge them, Timothy. Charge them who are rich in this age that they be not high-minded. That they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches. But, Timothy, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. In other words, Timothy, you pass on the news. Young man, you pass it on. Don't let any of your people, young pastors, be trusting in the things of this world. Don't let them trust in good times. Have their trust in the living God. And he is the one who gives riches, oh, such riches, all things, to enjoy. You know what? Good God's desire for us in this time of some suffering, Still have joy in him. We've spoken over the years many times on this pulpit. What if cancers should enter our own life or some other sickness or disease? You know, you often have such a thing a long time before it's diagnosed or revealed even that you have it. Often people have a normal life up until the point of discovering that they had cancer, let's say. They had it for quite a time. Then, sadly, it wasn't found until fairly recently. But up until the time, there's been some joy. So, but now I've got the diagnosis that that bad habit guy, that evil doctor told me the truth. I've got cancer. Now the joy he took with me, with his, with his toe payment, he took my joy. It shouldn't be that way for a believer in Jesus Christ. You and I, we're going to go through things in our lives together. If we know each other long enough, but we're going to go through many things together. We have already. We are to go through everything we go through, loving one another, exhorting one another, helping and encouraging one another, and still enjoy. Because at the center of our being is not our health. The center of our being is not based upon whether we're healthy or not healthy. It is based upon God, and He will never change. Mm -hmm. We think of the sins of the flesh, how pleasant, how wonderful, often their consequences weigh off in the future. Hey, listen, property, possession, security, my 401k, my iron this, my iron that, if your hope is in those things, think of those that have lost billions of dollars. Think about many others 
of a lower standard who have lost millions of dollars. And some of them don't have any prospects. And you and I right now, I, as one of our members is so pleased to say frequently in my ear, hey, listen, all is well. My father owns a cattle on a thousand hills. And the truth is, like the old song says, like the scripture says, it's true. Now, we have still such resources in our God. And be it cancer or the loss of everything we've got by way of monies or prospects or promises for our children, for ourselves, we still got him. And when he is the center of our being, by the peace and the joy, for all is well and all will be well. Timothy, charge them. Don't let them trust in riches. Don't let them trust in uncertain riches. But in the living God, Timothy, in the living God. Well, that's verse 18. Tell them to do good. Hard times. Reorganizing the priorities, kind of a transition, whatever. Hey, verse 18, charge them also that they do good. That they be rich in good works. Don't let our trouble jog our faith to get us to a place where we're still not as loving and caring and open and sharing and sacrificial as we were in the good times. You know, the reason is not we give because it's the good times, it's, the, it's because of who else is really in our center. God's in our center. Jesus Christ is what we're about. And it is He that should have the expectation for our living. And part of that should be generosity. Part of that should be sharing. Part of that <coughs> should be doing good, verse 18. Result that they may be rich. Not a result, really, this is a continuation. Make sure you're rich, Paul is saying here. Make sure you're rich in good works, ready to distribute, <coughs> willing to share, says Paul. What do you do as a result of that? You are establishing a fund in essence in heaven, so secure, so wonderful. First of all, God notices, and God knows. And equity is being built up somehow in heaven. You see that in verse 19? By doing all this, verse 19, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, there are hard times coming, that they may lay hold on eternal life. Things we do in regard to heaven always count more than their effect here. But what we do in effect here has such weight in heaven. Good works, service, faith, proper priorities. Please, says Paul, pass this on to your own. Because again, it's so important. And it begins with this verse in Exodus. Exodus 20, again, verse 3. Exodus 20, verse 3, the first of the commandments. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. You see, if there's another god, if there's something else in me that is there instead of God, it will hinder me in every way from living as a Christian ought. Remember the verses in 1 John we looked at some weeks ago. <coughs> God, through John, says, You cannot be my friend and be a friend of the world. And yet many of us are friends and so cozy in our friendship with the world. We must be different. We must be different. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3. Who also, Paul says, You all had our conversation, our manner of life. Every one of us had something different in the, be in the beginning in our being. But now we've been quickened. We've been moved from deadness, from death to life. My question is, is the Holy Spirit in you as you trusted Jesus Christ as the promise of God? And now, central to you at the heart of who you are and what you're about, it should not be good times, it should not be you yourself, your own gratification, your own comfort. It should be Almighty God. And I'm going to define it right now as the, this member of the Trinity. 
Jesus Christ. He is what we are about. He is what we are about. And so, we look at the Ten Commandments. What do they say? No other God. They say, no carved images. They say, no name of God taken in vain. They say, recognize the Sabbath. They say something we find so difficult, don't we? Honor thy father and thy mother. They say, do not kill. They say, do not commit adultery. They say, do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not covet. Are those things dear to God? We can get lost in our theological pawn positioning on our life's chessboard, but these are important to God. It should be important to us. We live in a day of grace, not of law. But if you love someone, you begin to notice the various things that please them, how you might delight them. You love them. What's about them is special to you. And what is special about God? Let us not forget one thing so special about God is His holiness. What about these commandments? It is foolish for us to throw out the Ten Commandments because they are His heart. They are from Him. And number one again is this. He must be the center. There must be no other God. Beware, you profess. Are these true? Are these real? Are these meaningful statements from God? Of course they are. And I'd like to suggest to you today that we need to decide there's an issue here. There is a battle. Is it war? Yes, there is a war going on, a spiritual warfare. We live in a world today of compromise. Because the economy's bust doesn't mean that that warfare is ended. It goes on, it persists. It's a complication. It is war. Are there issues? Is sin real? What about loneliness, restlessness, estrangement? What about shame? What about meaninglessness? We today exhibit often through the flesh corruption of thought. We can't think straight. Corruption of our emotions. We can't respond or initiate healthily. We find our intentions corrupted. Not only disappointment, but corrupted and corroded and dropped. We find our speech affected. Sin does. Our disposition have happened even to ourselves. God, oh God, have mercy. Remind us of our sin and its consequences. Does any of this have any effect? Any consequences? Are the sins of the flesh for real? Is sin real? In your notes, your bulletin, I have a statement I wish you would read and then ponder a little bit. Listen to this. We need to, this is about sin. We need to renew the knowledge of a persistent reality that used to evoke in us fear and hatred and grief. Many have sinned. Many of us have lost this knowledge, and we ought to reflect that loss for slippage in our consciousness of sin, like most fashionable follies, maybe pleasant, but it is also devastating. Self-deception about our sin is a narcotic a tranquilizing and disorienting suppression of our spiritual, sensual nervous system. What's devastating about it is that when we lack an ear for wrong notes in our lives, we cannot play right notes or even recognize them in the performance of others. Eventually, we make ourselves religiously so unmusical that we miss both the exposition and the recapitulation of the main themes God plays in human life. The music of creation and the still greater music of grace whistle right through our skulls, causing no catch of breath and leaving no residue. Moral 
beauty begins to bore us. The idea that the human race needs a savior sounds 